Even as we recognize Peter and Paul as perhaps the greatest among the apostles, and certainly central and crucial in our life of faith, there is some encouragement in remembering what else is true about them, that even after this great proclamation of Peter recognizing Jesus' divinity and his being the Messiah, that at the time of Jesus' suffering and passion and death, Peter denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And he had three chances to, to stop, after at least two chances, and, he, and still he denied that he knew the Lord. And Paul, of course, before he became a Christian and a follower of Jesus, uh, as a very ardent and faithful, uh, zealous Jewish leader, was hunting down Christians and killing them. And yet these two men have become the pillars of our family of faith, both in the leadership that Jesus delegated to humans, to men and women, but particularly in this case to men, to lead the church, and through the teaching and guidance and pastoral challenges of Paul. So they are the great apostles, but as another priest commenting on these readings in this feast day wrote, you could also call Peter the great denier, and Paul the great executioner. Why that can encourage us is, it's likely that all of us here, even the worst, most heinous or shameful sin we may have committed does not reach the depths of shame of denying Christ so blatantly and directly as Peter did or of executing Christians specifically because they were followers of Christ though of course Paul believed in his heart that he was doing the right thing and was being faithful to God in his Jewish uh, heritage and religion Still, certainly any sin is, is a tragedy and is a break and a weakening of ourselves and our relationship with God and with one another. But we can all, I believe, honestly say that nothing we have done was as deeply and shamefully sinful as executing Christians for their faith and of denying Christ at the moment when it would be most noble and righteous to say that you were his follower. And yet, Jesus, along with God the Father, chose these two men in their repentance and their conversion. Not only did he just welcome them back into the family and into a relationship with him, you know, he could certainly have just said, okay, I know you're sorry for what you've done, I accept your, for your repentance, but now you're going to have to just remain obscure and quiet in the background as the church develops because of what you've done. But instead, both of them rise and are elevated, as, as Father Rick said, that now 2,000 years later, we still recognize them as two of the greatest early leaders and teachers and preachers of our faith. Some of this contradiction, you might say, or a mystery of how God works, is captured by the entrance antiphon for this feast day, which we don't recite since we have the blessing of music and an opening hymn. But if this feast, the 29th of June, were on a weekday, the weekday mass family, we would have recited this entrance antiphon. This is part of it anyway. These men conquering all human frailty, shed their blood and helped the church to grow, they became the friends of God. And so one who persecuted and executed Jesus' followers, and one of his followers who denied that he even knew him, they became the friends of God and helped the church to grow. And if it's true for them, 
As God saved them from themselves, you might say, and saved them for the great work they were called to do, certainly the Lord can do the same for us. And each of us, even with the most honest analysis of what we have done wrong and what we fail to do that has led to sins of omission, can say, if God can welcome back Peter and Paul and call them to such great work in the church, He can do the same for us. And so, that can be a a hopeful thing, that all of us are qualified to continue or to try to serve God and to give ourselves over to the work that the Lord would have us do in whatever circle of influence we move in. It can also be a bit of a challenge then because we can't fall back on the excuse, well, I've been so sinful and I've done so many bad things, there's no possible way God could use me. You know, I'm lucky enough to be able to come to the church building without being struck by lightning, you might think. But this call of Paul and Peter to rise from the tombs, in a sense, of their sin and to become leaders in the work of the church shows us that we too, each of us here, all of us, no matter how old or young, no matter how badly we may have acted in the past or even our present and current struggles with sin, none of those disqualify us from being Jesus' co-workers here and now to advance God's will, to enrich our family of faith, to bring the justice and the integrity and the dignity and the humanity that God intends for all people to have. And so that's one encouragement, one lesson then, is we can count on God's mercy as He was merciful to Peter and Paul. And God's calling us and giving us the power and strength to live godly lives and to do godly things in the world today. But also, it tells us a little bit about our relationships with one another. And that if we are meant to imitate Jesus, as Jesus was so merciful and welcoming to these two men who did such things contrary to Him and sinned against Him, so we, when we treat and relate to one another, are called to that same mercy and patience and forbearance and forgiveness because it's also true that even the deepest authentic hurt that we may have experienced from someone else does not is nothing compared to what Peter and Paul did and so if Jesus can forgive them and call them back into service into a loving relationship with him so we would be challenged and encouraged to have that same mercy to others who have harmed us or wronged us, that if there's any way to seek reconciliation with them, we can at least make the initiative. If there isn't, we can pray for God to work in their lives, that somehow God will bring about His will for them. We can be merciful as God was merciful.